Good morning, Alfred Street. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord on this, our second seminary Saturday for 2024. And I had a busy week. I'm sure some of you all had a busy week. I woke up this morning feeling grateful. I am so grateful that we are a part of a congregation that has a pastor who wants us to think. That real, amen, right? That creates space for us to have thoughtful dialogue and disagree with, with respect, right? We don't all have to see it the same way. We're not all in the same place. And if we're honest, over the course of our lives, we might change our mind about a few things. That's learning and growing. And so I'm grateful to be a part of a church that embraces that process. This year for our Seminary Saturday series, we are looking at the intersection of faith and politics. What does it mean to be people of God in this world and how do we show up in the political realm? How do we show up in the religious and faith realms as people who want to be informed and salt and light everywhere they go? Last week we had a lovely foundation given to us by Reverend Siobhan Arline Bradley. And because this is Alfred Street, we're going to keep doing the dang thing. And today we are so excited to have Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas from Vanderbilt University. Y'all don't know how lucky we are that when we get these esteemed scholars from all over the country and ask them to come, they say yes. And so we're delighted to have him here. Um, Dr. Floyd Thomas is uh, married to Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas, who is also a professor at Vanderbilt. We'll be hearing from her tomorrow. So, um, so today is Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas, tomorrow is Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas. So we're grateful to have both of them here. We're going to follow our program and we, and we will begin by passing the peace. And as you do so, should you happen to see a woman who has on some crimson and cream, please wish the ladies of Delta Sigma Theta sorority a happy Founders Day. Let's pass the peace to one another. And now we'll have our video intro. Welcome to 
to our second session of Seminary Saturday Bible Study as we present Professor Juan Floyd Thomas, Associate Professor of African American Religious History at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. As a professor, he's taught a plethora of engaging, challenging, and sought-after courses such as The Religious Thought of Howard Thurman, Black Churches and the Quest for Economic Justice, Moral Philosophy of Black Popular Culture, and Slave Religion and Culture in the African American South to name a few. A forward-thinking and distinguished author, Dr. Floyd Thomas has authored The Origins of Black Humanism, Reverend Ethelred Brown, and the Unitarian Church and Liberating Black Church History, Make It Plain. He's also the co-author of Black Church Studies, An Introduction and the Altars Where We Worship, The Religious Significance of Popular Culture in the United States, with Mark Toulouse and Stacey Floyd Thomas. His literary work can also be found in media outlets ranging from The Washington Post, Esquire, Boston Globe, NPR's All Things Considered, and WBEZ's Sound Opinions. He's continuously requested to be a guest lecturer and presenter amongst renowned educational institutions such as the Williams Institute Lecturers at Methodist Theological School in Ohio and Convocation Lecturers at Princeton Theological Seminary's 2022 Engel Institute of Preaching. Dr. Floyd Thomas holds a doctorate in history from the University of Pennsylvania, an MA in history from Temple University and a bachelor's degree from Rutgers University. Alfred Street Baptist Church, please welcome to Seminary Saturday, Dr. Juan Floyd Thomas. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? All right, greetings. I, I don't know. I must have died because this must be heaven. Hello. Um, already, uh, let me uh, um, establish some measure of protocol and show that I have some uh, degree of home, uh, home training. Um, thank you. Thank you for welcoming, welcoming me as well as my beloved bride, uh, Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas, whose, jo whose voice is going to make you rejoice on tomorrow. Um, we extend greetings and salutations on behalf of our home church, Friendship West Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, where our senior pastor is uh, Freddie Douglas Haynes III. Uh, yes, yes. So from our fa fabulous family of faith to this great and fantastic house of God, we just want to say greetings. Um, in his absence, his well-deserved uh, vacationing absence, we want to lift up uh, the great shepherd of this house, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. Um, you know, the <laughs> as a first-time visitor to uh, um, this mighty, mighty house of God, to feel the exuberant excellence that just radiates from the top to the bottom and, and side to side. Uh, if y'all don't know how good you got it, let, let a stranger tell you, y'all got it good. Y'all got it real good. Um, I also want to lift up a, a dear beloved uh, sister from another mister, uh, um, a, a friend, a colleague like no other, uh, the Reverend Dr. Judy Fentress Williams. <laughs> Right. In a, in a galaxy of, of many stars, she is truly the rockiest star of them all. Uh, okay. And we want to say thank you uh, um, just for making this possible. Um, thank you for um, guiding the way in these seminary Saturdays. I mean, uh, um, I marvel literally uh, at the fact that folks are gathered here on a, on a sunny Saturday and don't think it robbery to, to be uh, praying people who think and thinking people who pray. Um, a last note of thanks I want to give before getting into uh, the meat of why we're here is I want to lift up Miss Tiffany Diggs, um, you know, because I, um, in the work that we do um, going uh, from coast to coast and sometimes even overseas, um, you wrestle with uh, the very fundamental job of the logistics of getting people where they need to be and what they need. And I'm thanking Ms. Diggs because she makes these logistics seem so logical. <laughs> All right, um, you know, you, you, it, it would boggle the mind that, that you know, folks don't get it, that um, to help people, you know, it, it's a blessing to be a blessing to others. Um, and once again, that exuberant excellence that just radiates from, from the 
top to the bottom and all around this uh, fine family of faith, I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> so as we proceed, um, I wanted to lift up uh, this passage of, of scripture taken from uh, Joshua, the first chapter. Uh, if you have your Bibles or, or your Bible app or any other means of uh, um, uh, tapping into the scripture in the 21st century, please, by all means, you're looking at the uh, first chapter of Joshua, uh, verses one through six. And the reading goes as such. After Moses, the servant of the Lord, had died, the Lord said to Moses' aid, Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, my servant, is dead. So now, you and the whole people with you, prepare to cross the Jordan to the land that I will give the Israelites. Every place where you set foot, I have given you, as I promised Moses. All the land of the Hittites, from the wilderness and the Lebanon east to the great river Euphrates and west to the great sea will be your territory. No one can withstand you as long as you live. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and steadfast so that you may give this people possession of the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Only be strong and steadfast. Be careful to observe the entire law with which Moses, my servant, enjoined on you. Do not swerve from it either to the right or to the left that you may succeed wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your lips. Recite it by day and by night that you may carefully observe all that is written in it. Then you will attain your goal. Then you will succeed. I command you, be strong and steadfast. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So Joshua commanded the officers of the people, go through the camp and command the people. Prepare your provisions for three days from now. You shall cross the Jordan here to march in and possess the land your, your God is giving you your possession. These, this is the reading of the word of God. So, uh, in keeping with the, the topic, the, the theme that uh, I've uh, put forth, seeking peace in the promised land, the black Christian witness and the crisis in the Middle East. First piece I wanted to at least uh, entertain and, and have us imagine is, what do we mean when we actually use the, the expression or the term promised land? Now for many, uh, promised land is a term designating a geographic, a very specific geographic region of the world that God has promised, quite literally promised, as a heritage to his chosen people of Israel. Now, the promised land in and of itself is not the official name of Israel's territorial boundaries or geographic borders, but what it, what it conveys, what it, what it uh, generates for folks is a, a much larger historical and spiritual meaning based on the biblical teaching that I just uh, shared with you. The promised land was a sacred inheritance bestowed upon the children of Israel, God's chosen people, wherein they the established this new nation on, on the face of the earth, Israel. And if uh, by a chance, if you all have the handouts uh, that uh, should have been uh, circulated, um, I had a handful of key terms that often uh, are very, thank you, thank you so much. Um, they're going around now, so um, please uh, don't worry. You're gonna get yours, you're gonna, you're gonna get it. <laughs> I think they're in good supply, so we're, 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 we're off to a great start. Um, one of the things that uh, in, in our current uh, day and time needs to be uh, sorted out is when we talk about Israel, there's ancient biblical Israel, and then there's the modern state of Israel, right? And I know that, um, you know, I don't wanna, you know, uh, spend too much time talking about the painfully obvious, but, so for instance, you know, for the many of us who might have driver's licenses, right? Um, on your driver's license, I'm presuming if, if the DMV here in the DMV is, <laughs> is, is, you know, is on their game, right? None of your driver's licenses have your baby pictures on them, 
Okay, all right, all right, good. I just got to check this out. All right, so by the same, same standard, even though these, these nations bear the same name, right? The kingdom of Israel, right, dates back thousands of years ago. It went in and out of existence, as, as you'll see uh, indicated on, on the sheet here, right? Um, there were periods in times where the, where the kingdom of Israel rose, then fought, fell, then came back in a, in a slightly diminished fashion, then went away again, right? Was in, invaded and conquered by various empires, last but not least the, the Roman Empire, right? Right, there are various configurations of Israel that we know of in, in our sacred scripture. Then there is the state of Israel that was established in, uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War in 1948. And that is the current state of Israel that we know, that it shares some of the, um, some of the geographical, uh, uh, physical uh, footprint of the, the ancient biblical nation, but they are not the same. And so when we do wrestle with this, this conversation about quote unquote promised land, right, um, some of that debate or some of that concern hovers around you know, people, for want of a better expression, uh, playing the name game and, and assuming and asserting that, oh, well, if it's Israel, then that, that we, we, can't, we can't debate this or we can't uh, um, you know, somehow have any kind of conversation or consideration that this might be more complicated than just identifying the name, tracking it back to the Bible and saying that there was no disruption or no interruption between then and now. Okay. What I also like to lift up is that, especially within the, the history and the heritage of, of black Christian faith, right, there are many times, many ways, especially as a, as a people, we've grappled with and, and engaged with the story of the Israelites, the story of Exodus, right? Um, within uh, um, the teaching of religion and theology, we often refer to this as the Exodus motif, right? This idea that as a people who also have shared in a, in a state of bondage, in a state of oppression, much like our ancestors, and yes, I am saying this, much like our ancestors in biblical terms, right, the Israelites of thousands of years ago, right, when they encountered a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. This kinship that, that transcended time and space, right, many enslaved and even freed black folk who are trying to think how can we overcome this, this social sin, this moral evil in our presence known as slavery, known as dehumanization, known as oppression, right? We have a body of, of musical and what I often refer to as sung theology known as the spirituals, right? And one of those songs, you know, I've, have a snippet of it uh, shown up above to Canaan's fair and happy land, where folks were lifting up in, in sometimes anonymous fashion, but oftentimes in, in collective form, how we were thinking about the, the land that God promised us, right? For many folk, it was places and spaces like Alfred Street, right? A, a place where you could be a free and full human, right? Even in the midst of, of slavery all around you, right? For some folks, especially if you were living down where we live in Tennessee and, and further south in places like Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, and the like, right? You had to press your way north to freedom, right? Some folks kept pushing, right? New York wasn't good enough, right? They had to keep going to Canada. Some folks kept pressing until they saw Santa Claus in the North Pole. But okay, all right, just, you know, as far north as you could get, Right? And that, that, that leads us to think and, and fully understand what we don't appreciate in our own day and time. And please believe me, I understand we got our own challenges and struggles here in uh, 2024. But how far would you go? How fast would you run if you're in a state of, of just absolute terror and trauma and you knew that freedom was on the other side of where you were going? How fast, how far would you go? What would you do? to get what you needed to get, right? We oftentimes take this for granted. 
Um, but this idea that I'm bound for the promised land, right? Sometimes that was a physical state. Sometimes that was a, a mental and emotional state. More often than not, it had to be a spiritual state, right? I, you know, I need what God has promised me, right? And even then, right, without the benefit of a seminary Saturday, even without the, the benefit of, of more degrees than a hot oven, right, without the, without the, the benefit of, you know, um, you know, as my wife and I have the, the luxury and the privilege of, of um, operating in an a, um, institution of higher education, right, those hallowed halls were very hollow when it came to bringing people like us through them. Um, okay, let's speak the truth in a church. Um, but the idea that, the idea that those folks knew what the word, the work, and worth of God's message to all humanity was really about, right? That this promise was something that we all had the right to reach for and obtain. Well, so much so, and lifting up the work of a, a colleague, uh, um, Eddie Glaude Jr., um, one of his, uh, I think, most esteemed books is uh, Exodus. And in this book, him taking a look and talking about the, what he refers to as Exodus politics, that very much in the period in which uh, Alfred Street was founded in the early 1800s, right, when this nation, newly formed, right, which lets you know, first of all, choices that could and, and should have been made at that point in time about slavery and or freedom, right? This nation elected, and I, I don't use that word lightly, to establish things like the Three-Fifths Compromise, established the notion that s slavery could exist in a nation that declared itself land of the free and home of the brave that we could be a house divided, that one half of the nation could be free, one half of the nation could be uh, enslaved, and it could be business as usual. So understand that. And yet this fine institution, as just one symbol of, of uh, an outpost of freedom in an other wor otherwise world of slavery, right, for black folk like us, Gloud is talking about an exodus politics, right? right? You know, we oftentimes refer to this as the abolitionist movement, right? The Underground Railroad, things of that sort. Folks, looking back to the history of Moses and the Israelites, but moving that forward into their present in the 1800s to think, okay, if God did it then, God could do it now, right? What happened back then, right? You're up against a world and a system that said that you will never be free to finding freedom in that time. So if he could do it then, if he did it before, he could do it again. All right. Well, Gloud and myself and, and other of us who, who are envisioning uh, um, God's power of liberation doesn't have an expiration date. This exodus politics has to move forward, right? It, we shouldn't just keep it under glass or lock it up in a museum, right? What I'm suggesting and what we're gonna be talking about uh, for the remainder of our time together is how this exodus politics moves and breathes and extends beyond just the moment in time of slavery, of, of literal chattel slavery in America. It moves past segregation, it moves into the, the here and now. Now speaking of the here and now, as much as um, we're, we're talking about and focusing on the Holy Land, I believe and feel that we need to also focus on the Holy One, God's only begotten Son. And um, this is a, um, an, a side note, and I thank you all for that uh, amazing introduction, uh, introductory video. You know, some introductions you have to live into, some you have to live up to. I guess I'm gonna have to live up to all y'all said about me, all right? Show nobody's a liar up in here. <laughs> um, as was mentioned, one of my, uh, one of my pride and joys is um, having uh, um, resurrected a course on Howard Thurman at our institution uh, down in uh, Nashville. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, lift up, especially given our topic of conversation this morning, um, that this is the 75th anniversary of um, probably the most cherished book in uh, um, 
uh, Dr. Thurman's long and esteemed uh, um, scholarship, uh, Jesus and the Disinherited. If y'all don't know, not only um, was uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Howard uh, W. Thurman, bless you, um, not only was he um, one of the finest uh, ministers and theologians that this nation has ever produced, but also he was a Morehouse man, so that might mean something to some folk. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just saying. Um, he was also at one point in time the, the dean of Rankin Chapel down, down at HU. He was also, okay, that might mean something to some other folk, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, he also went up to some place called Boston and was, a, was the dean there, dean of chapel there. Well, I ain't gonna say that, but you know. Okay, <laughs> All right. All right. Boston University had some good folk too. Um, okay, but, um, but the idea that, you know, to give you a sense of, of uh, the scope of his grandeur and, and his contribution to our, our challenges and struggles as a people, during uh, the height of the civil rights movement, it is often claimed that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had two books always with him in his briefcase. One is the Bible. The second is this book, uh, Jesus and Disinherited. That these two works, side by side, help King accomplish what he was able to accomplish in his way too short lifespan. So lifting that up, I want to um, take uh, from uh, the early pages of this text a, a key note that uh, Dr. Thurman uh, shares with us. The significance of the religion of Jesus to people who stand with their backs against the wall has always seemed to me to be crucial. This is a question which individuals and groups who live in our land always under the threat of profound social and psychological displacement face. Why is it that Christianity seems impotent to deal radically and therefore effectively with the issues of discrimination and injustice on the basis of race, religion, and national origin? Is this impotency due to the betrayal of the genius of the religion? Or is it due to a basic weakness in the religion itself? Now, I mean, this is a hard question and facing harsh realities, but if you're standing rock solid in your faith, I believe God can withstand your, your, your little itty bitty questions, right? The greatness of God does not crumble before your, your, your weakness or your curiosity. Okay, now situated in a pivotal historical moment such as his own lifetime when this book was written in 1949, and please keep, keep track of that date because I'll, I'll circle back to that. Thurman's stirring words were put forth in the aftermath of, of what at that time was not only a global struggle against totalitarian dictatorships, militarized bloodshed and godless genocide, and also on the verge of a rising tide of oppressed peoples all around the world fomenting social justice and anti-colonial movements in the latter half of the 20th century. So even now, by celebrating, you know, as, as we should in this kickoff of celebrating the 75th anniversary of this uh, masterpiece, I'm equally interested in looking at how this momentous event also coincides with the fact that just last year marked the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the modern day, modern state of, of Israel. Yet whether one is also con a confessing black Christian who believes that there's no crime to thinking, praying, and praising all at the same time? How do we answer that potent question that, that Thurman put before us, right? That literally speaks volumes about the efficacy and even the exigency of our faith, or as Thurman himself proclaims, that there must be the clearest possible understanding of the anatomy of the existential issues facing those whose backs are against the wall. So as we address this crisis anew in the 21st century, our houses of worship and, and faith communities must be places to ask deeper, more probing questions of ourselves, of our nation, of our world, and even of our faith traditions, especially in times of local, national, and global crises. As we navigate war and rumors of war, some of what brings us all here this morning, domestic and international terrorism, and acts of violence beyond comprehension, Thurman reminds us that our work and witness calls us to reflect on critical theological questions, but also find the courage to embrace difficult, desperate answers. 
What do the words of sacred scripture and the work of social witness mean for a hurting humanity who are brutalized, beleaguered, and burdened in all places? What does Jesus have to say to the walking wounded and the openly outcast people of our world? For those who are perennially ranked amongst the least of these in this world, what hope or help can a feckless faith provide? To paraphrase the incisive insights drawn from uh, one of our uh, iconic pop songstresses, I'm talking about Janet Jackson here. All right, I know your religion used to do nice stuff for you, but what has it done lately? <laughs> but seriously, in all seriousness now, is neither apostasy nor apathy to ask legitimate questions about whether the current religious state of affairs is sufficient as a remedy for those who have their backs against the wall? How can we harness our belief, our being, our behavior to serve as an instrument of social justice in order to achieve divine peace in a world that's on fire? So, in this effort to uh, bring together the best possible marriage of faith, intellect, and action, we must dare to ask the questions which probe and challenge and push us, affirming that only by reasoning together with respect and, and charity, as well as clarity, you gotta be clear, can we propose solutions to the questions of how we serve those whose backs are against the wall? What such religious reflection demands of us is that while confronting widespread indiscriminate uh, loss of life, we must recognize that this carnage is fueled by wholesale indifference towards the value of human life in our society and culture. So let me say this, right? Uh, a few years ago, not so long ago, right, there was this uh, abundant uh, kind of uh, clapback and, and debate about Black Lives Matter, right? Assuming and asserting that somehow those three words were somehow uh, um, an offense, were somehow you know, audacious in, in asserting and assuming that black humanity's existence on the planet meant something, that God didn't make us by mistake or accident. So then a lot of folks would say, well, oh, well, well all lives matter. And that was, I, I'll speak for myself, but I hope other folks echo this, that was never in dispute. But, but somehow, so, I'm pro-life, I'm alive, I'm pro-life. Uh, okay, and that's a debate we can have. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thumbs up on this thing. So, but here's the thing about you know, what those folks who were trying to um, throw sand in the gears were really messing up on. You know, right, they were trying to have a false argument, right? Saying that, so for instance, if a house in your neighborhood's on fire and you call 911 and report it, right, you're not saying that all houses don't matter. You're saying the house down the block that's on fire needs the water. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so if anybody ever tries to push up, you know, push on, uh, you know, pull up on you like an Amazon uh, delivery truck and try to, you know, tell you some foolishness about that, you can set them straight in, in the spirit and love of God. Um, but here, <laughs> all right, always do these things. All right, make it plain, right? But what we're wrestling with here, and I, I lost the, thank you, thank you. Uh, the first and foremost thing that Thurman is effective in doing is now sp speaking to this in terms of, once again, Thurman is writing and thinking and talking about these matters at a time when we don't have a civil rights movement Right? The civil rights movement hadn't even been officially underway by the time this book is, is um, put into print. Right? We don't have black liberation theology or womanist theology or any of the, um, the inspired uh, black biblical uh, criticism and hermeneutics. Right? We don't have the tools within the, the, the spaces and places that prepare people for the ministry and the leadership of, of fine institutions like Alfred Street right? at that time. Right? He's, he's building the plane as it's on the runway, right? getting ready to take off. And yet, you know, as we always do, we got to make something out of nothing. Right? Thurman is grappling with, okay, first and foremost, right, situating the history and the reality of Jesus within a world of color, within a world, right, because you know, I don't know if this is uh, going to be a, um, a, a hidden fact for anyone, but, but the idea that 
the Bible takes place in, in a world of color, right? You know, colorful. Okay, all right. It's good to come to a place where folk got some sense so you don't have to translate so much. Thank you for helping me in uh, doing some of this heavy lifting. Whoo! Because sometimes that would be the whole lesson. Sometimes I would just have to, you know, folks would break my back just trying to get that one point across. Okay. Right. So what we always grapple with is that, you know, by the time you get to the New Testament, right, you know, the, the back half of the Bible, right, the only Europeans in sight are the Romans. Right. Okay. So, you know. And last I checked, Paul didn't write any uh, letters to Switzerland or write any, uh, you know. Okay, so the idea that Thurman, even though, you know, he, and, you know, um, having taught and wrestled with uh, his writings and his thinkings for so long, right, there's a sweet stillness to, to Thurman that, that is, uh, percolates, it radiates from the page. If you, if you haven't read this book, you know, I, I highly... Uh, um, encourage y'all to grab a hold of it. It's a thin book, but well worth um, your reading and your time. But to um, share this, we begin with the simple uh, historical fact that Jesus was a Jew. It is impossible for Jesus to be understood outside the sense of community which, which Israel held with God. This does not take away, anything, uh, take anything away from him, rather does it heighten the challenge which his life presents. For such reflection reveals him as the product of the constant working of the creative mind of God upon the life, thought, and character of a race of people. Here, here is one who was so conditioned and organized with, within himself that he became a perfect instrument of the embodiment of a set of ideals, ideals of such dramatic potency that they were capable of changing the calendar, rechanneling the thought of the world, and placing a new sense of the rhythm of life in a weary, nerve snap civilization. So even just by, by putting his toe in the water that way, right, didn't have to make any kind of, you know, big radical statement about the being of, of Jesus, the physical, you know, the, the human face and, and side of Jesus, but saying Jesus operated and lived, existed within a community and a tradition that understanding what he was talking about in 1949, right, a population of people who had just encountered the Nazi Holocaust and had just been subjugated to, to terror and torture, but also Right, because you know, uh, coming from a signifying folk, you know, you say one thing, but it has multiple meanings. Right, Thurman, when he doubles down on that notion of race of people, do not get it twisted. He is sending a, a notice, a notification to the population at large, especially those folks who say they're Christian. But I'm, I'm borrowing from uh, the the late great uh, Frederick Douglass. Right, you know, their Christianity was a mouth religion. Right, they were given lip service to, to um, being, being followers of the Prince of Peace, but they were demonstrating anything but, right? That in a day and time when folks who are inhabiting, you know, the darker nations of the world, or, and, you know, that could even count for the Deep South, that we were being threatened with death instead of life by virtue of the fact that God made us different. Not differently, just different. Okay, and, and please emphasize that. All right. So also mapping out the social context in which uh, we're, we're talking and thinking about these things. Thurman also lifts up uh, this statement, and I want you all to emphasize this. To place Jesus against the background of his time is by no means sufficient to explain him. The historical setting in which Jesus grew up, the psychological mood and temper of the age and of the house of Israel, the economic and social predicament of Jesus' family, all these are important, but they in themselves are unable to tell us precisely the thing that we most want to know. Why does he differ from many others in the same setting? Any explanation of Jesus in terms of psychology politics, economics, religion, or the like, must inevitably explain his contemporaries as well. It may, it may tell why Jesus was a particular kind of Jew, but not why some other Jews were not Jesus. And that is the most important question, since the thing which makes him most significant is not the way in which he resembled his fellows, but the way in which he differed from all the rest of them. Uniqueness always escapes us as we undertake an analysis of character. So the idea that 
how and why and when and where Jesus moved through the world defies our logic, right? But not, it, it does not escape the mind of God, right? So the idea that how are you going to be peaceful in a land that, that knows nothing but war and conquerors and conquests, right? How are you going to love your enemy, right? You know, that doesn't, that doesn't work for me, right? If, if my humanity, you know, overtakes and, and, and uh, knocks out any sense of divinity within me, right? I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be mad. I'm going to be hateful and spiteful, da, 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 right? Gravitate towards your lesser being rather than your greater being, right? Part of what, what uh, the challenge of what Thurman is doing in this text and what it lends us today as, as lessons and legacies for our black Christian witness is the necessity, the urgency to decolonize Christianity, right? Even as much as the, the debates and the crisis, the conflict in the Middle East is about decolonizing the Holy Land, we also gotta decolonize our holiness is the, is the concern here, right? We cannot just sit comfortably with any kind of notion of terrorism or, or terror, torture, trauma, right? And say, well, you know, that's just the way it is. That's just the way of the world, right? You know, we, uh, I, I mentioned this, uh, I know I'm gonna get a, a, a shot, an angry look from uh, my beloved spouse. Uh, not angry, but you know, she gonna feel a sort, sort of way. Um, our daughter, our only child, uh, you know, just turned uh, 15 on uh, December 27th, or as she affectionately refers to it, two days after Jesus's birthday. <laughs> All right. Um, but what we wrestle with, uh, you know, even with that young one, is thinking about, okay, how how to explain how to, you know, as all, all of us, right, who, you know, have uh, young ones, if, if they're ours biologically or, or through any other means or whatever, you know, you know, from other mothers and farther fathers, right, right, you know, you know, families uh, of uh, our choosing or our own making, right, trying to hand off to them this faith, these beliefs, right, right, let them know, okay, right, to walk in the way of the Lord, to walk in the way of, of Jesus, right, is, right, there should be no shame, there should be no regret or resentment, there should, you know, right, what we, in this day and age, right, have submitted ourselves to is that, you know, by growing up, right, there's certain things that we now tolerate that, you know, many children are not allowed to do, right, all right, I'm not going to get political, all right, you know, I don't want anybody's 501c3 getting threatened or anything, but let me just say this, if folks in a kindergarten class behave like some folks in Capitol Hill behaved, right? Oh baby, time out wouldn't be enough, <laughs> okay, right? right? How is it that grown folk who have elected and appointed uh, um, roles of leadership in our nation and the world behave worse than, you know, an after school uh, program? I'm just saying, <laughs> okay. Okay, you know, and if y'all don't appreciate that, you know, you know, we can talk about it in break time. Um, but what we're wrestling with here in terms of the decolonization of, of the faith is not to submit and surrender to the way of empire, to the, to the notion that Jesus paid it all and yet we can't have peace. Jesus paid it all, but we can't have peace prosperity over poverty. Jesus paid it all, but we can't have freedom, justice, equality, and human dignity, right? So then what did Jesus do this all for? If the world is more broken now than it was when, when uh, Jesus was hanging on the cross in Calvary. Okay, I'm just saying. So to this point, okay, um, lifting up a, a, a key point that Thurman raises in, in the text, there is one overmastering problem that the socially and politically disinherited always face, right? He's setting this in the context of Jesus uh, during his lifetime, but it, it spreads, it, it broadens out to all of us, even here and now. Under what terms is survival possible? 
In the case of the Jewish people in the Greco-Roman world, the problem was even more acute than under ordinary circumstances because it had to do not only with physical survival in terms of life and limb, but also with the actual survival of a culture and a faith. Judaism was a culture, a civilization, and a religion, a total worldview in which there was no provision for any form of thoroughgoing dualism. The crucial problem of Judaism was to exist as an isolated, autonomous, cultural, religious, and political unit in the midst of a hostile, Hellenistic world. All right. So that's a lot, and I know I threw a lot of vocabulary at y'all in that. But strip it all down straight to the bone. What is it to me, what is it to be an oppressed culture in a world that is, was not made for you, or does not welcome and or want you? Right? Have you, have you ever felt that way before, y'all? All right. So, you know, for, uh, you know, I'm chronologically gifted and biologically blessed, uh, you know, of a certain age now where I can remember uh, what some of the older folks were saying that you had to work twice as hard to get half as much. But last I checked, that wasn't one of the Ten Commandments, right? That was not the way God had intended the world to be. It is the world, the way the world is. But once again, so what Thurman is sharing here is we did not make the world. We did not choose the way of the world, right? But we, much like the Jewish population, you know, in the, in the time of the Roman Empire, right? They had to find a way to survive in a hostile and harsh world that was bound to destroy them, right? If you let it, right? Not because that's the way God designed it, or define the world. And this is what, you know, I'll say this for my classroom at Vanderbilt. Um, one of the things to, to constantly remind all students, right, is when we're wrestling with social injustice and just flat out evil, right, there, there is such a thing as evil in the world. We're, we witness this, we ought to recognize it as such. Um, not celebrate it, no, I'm not saying that, but uh, you know, as scripture says, be wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. Thank you. All right, it's good to be in a house where people know the word. Uh, okay, man. Um, but the idea that in acknowledging and understanding some of these problems that we're facing, God didn't have anything to do with. All right, right, you know, right? When somebody's acting crazy on your job, that, you know, that, that wasn't, you know, of divine uh, um, origin and, and creation or whatever. That's that person acting a fool, right? Now, God invested in us a, a, a spirit of strength and a sound mind and not of fear, right? So if somebody is, you know, talking crazy like their, their jaw's been wired shut or whatever, you, you might have to, you know, educate them in a loving and, and a firm fashion, <laughs> okay, you know, right, you know. But here's the thing, and... Uh, you know, I, I say this uh, um, as we uh, proceed to both our, our uh, Q&A and then for, for uh, I know some folks will celebrate our break. Um, I lift up this work from a, um, a colleague in uh, biblical studies, uh, Alan Callahan, um, when he's talking about the Bible as the book of the oppressed. Okay. Right. Um, you know, this, this is playing on the notion from... Uh, um, the late great uh, black liberation theologian, uh, James Cone, who talked about the God of the oppressed. But you can't get to the, for many of us, we were not able to get to the God of the oppressed until we got through the book of the oppressed, right? Um, right. And what Callahan says here, as modernity's most thoroughly humili humiliated people, small wonder that African-Americans have taken the texts of the Bible so eagerly and earnestly. Slavery's children entered history from below, from the, the straight advantage they, they came to see in the Holy Scriptures that God grants victory to the unlikeliest people, people like themselves, and by the unlikeliest means. The Bible privileges those without privilege and honors those without honor. And so there is a special affinity between the Bible and the rankest of its readership's rank and file. All right? So... When we have to operate in, in spaces and places where the Bible had all, already had us 
on its pages. God already had us on God's mind, right? But then we run through certain, certain uh, um, perspectives within uh, Christian life where we're taught and told black folks are, we had to be introduced and brought into Christianity when Christianity was already in and among us, right? So, you know, and I know we've been having a lot of debates in recent years, and once again, as that kind introductory video uh, um, demonstrated, uh, one of the courses I, I teach, in fact, I'm currently in it now, is uh, slave religion and culture. And one of the greatest crimes ever per perpetrated in uh, human history was the assumption that slave masters did us a service or a favor by kidnapping us, enslaving us, buying and selling and trading us, and then if they they had uh, you know either the conscience or or the good sense to you know set up a church or or, or introduce us to uh, um, Sunday Sunday morning service right that that was them doing a good thing right versus what we talk about you know those of us who talk about and teach and preach uh, um, slave religion which is the enslaved knew for themselves that they weren't the bottom of a shoe. The enslaved knew for themselves, right? As much as, as I was talking about before, about trying to um, race and chase for freedom, also understanding that God meant more, not only to them, but for them, right? And unfortunately, this may be a lesson that we got to circle back around and pick up again in our own day and time, right? Um, now, granted, y'all had the benefit and the blessing of being in a fine, uh, um, fine family of faith like Alfred Street, right? But there are folks out there, you know, and I'm sure if, if uh, you know, um, this neck of the woods is anything like uh, what we got going on down in uh, Tennessee, right? You know, here in Alexandra, up the road in Anacostia, right? You know, go all around the MVP, you know, if y'all got the, you know, if y'all got the time, you know, make your way up to Baltimore, right? There are spaces and places on every doorstep and on every corner where folks need to hear this word, right? And you know, as much as we'll talk about it on the second half of our conversation here, the, the space for mission and ministry isn't just overseas. It's not just international, right? We still, we still got a lot of work to do right here in the US of A, all right? So speaking of the work we have to do, I wanted to op offer up an opportunity for, you know, because I know I've been talking a lot about a lot. Um, if there are any questions right now, I'd love to entertain some. We want to remind you to come to the mics to ask your questions so our online audience can hear. And the loving reminder that a question is not a speech. <laughs> it's not a testimony. Question. A question has a beginning, middle, and end, yeah, yeah, okay. Good morning, church. Good morning. So, as we talk about, my name is David Street, by the way. Welcome. I'm from Prince, Prince Frederick. So, um, my wife and I are here. But as we talk about this Middle East, I think we should keep a couple of things in, 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 in our thoughts. When we talk about where is the Middle East? Uh, I, I, I'd like you to kind of talk a little bit about the geography of the Middle East and how it connects us to what we're talking about and what's going on right now. There's a lot of, lot of things that we grapple with and a lot of things we really don't understand um, from a historical perspective because where's the Middle East? Uh, Anthony Browder says it's Northeast Africa, uh, right? And that's right. It's Northeast Africa. When we talk about Egypt, a lot of people don't even consider that uh, a country in and of itself, but that's North Africa. So some of those things we really got to think about and how historically um, media has distorted our understanding of what um, this whole Middle East and uh, Jews, they're black Jews, they're Russian Jews, they're Chinese Jews. It's what, what's really, it, it's really all about the distortion of our history. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, Brother Street. Well, first and foremost, the, the question had the answer in it. So, I mean, 
And that's the best combination you can imagine. Um, no, and I mean this in all seriousness and sincerity, right? Um, the idea that, you know, as a historian, right, a great atrocity has, has occurred where to try and erase Egypt and the quote unquote Middle East from our memory and from our understanding, because if you create that as a, a kind of dead zone, or you create this in a way in which I can't imagine, right? And I'm, I'm of a certain age where we were um, knee deep in the kind of Afrocentric uh, um, movement, right? You know, some of y'all had those leather medallions, right? With the continent on it, you know what I'm saying? You yeah, don't act like I was the only one with a Queen Latifah record, <laughs> okay, you know? Uh, or, you know, I wasn't the only one out there. All right, you know, Boogie Down Productions, okay. Um, but the idea that, the idea that to erase Africa, well, let me say it this way, to erase Egypt from Africa and to say that, you know, Egyptian civilization, culture, history, and everything that it contributed to the world had no relationship to the rest of, of the African continent and the African peoples, right? The idea that even though the Greeks came through, the Romans came through, even Napoleon, I don't know how many folks uh, spend any portion of their life watching that Napoleon movie, like all eight years of it. Um, but the idea that Napoleon, as, as a Frenchman who also, let's, let's just uh, kindly remember, tried to reintroduce slavery into all of the Americas, right? There was that little thing known as the Haitian Revolution to shake it off, all right? And they won, by the way, y'all. Um, the idea that Egypt and its place in human history was being denied and deprived because to create a context in which no person of color, no black person, no African person could, could recognize themselves in human history as accomplished and built, building something of, of value and worth to humanity. Not just ourselves, but to humanity, right? We don't have, in simple terms, we don't have the study of psychology without Egyptian knowledge, right? right? So cool is the derivation of, or the root word by which the, the Greeks got psyche, which eventually evolves into the word that we know of as psychology. I mean, right? So the first people to think about what it means to be a person, right? We are denying and depriving ourselves access to that power and that possibility when we overlook the fact that humanity, in so many regards, evolved and emerged from that. Now, the question I want to throw on the table as well is, especially dealing with the narrative that we're dealing with in terms of Exodus, what happens when we have to grapple, and this isn't original to me, this is also something that uh, the late, great Al Rabito uh, entertained in his own work, but can we be both the kings and queens of Egypt and the children of the house of Israel, right? In that narrative, do you have to pick and choose sides between Pharaoh and Moses, right? And how do you grapple with that? Are we still grappling with that here in the United States in 2024, right? Am I in the house or am I in the field, all right? Is the house on fire? Is the field a burning, right? Which side are we on? Okay, all right, please, I'm sorry. I'm a member of Alpha Street. I just wanted to know if your courses are available for audit. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on down, brother, come on down, all right? I, I think we're setting up an online uh, apparatus soon, but uh, you know, you're more than welcome. Come on through, all right? We got stuff for you. And also through our uh, Kelly Miller Smith uh, um, uh, Institute on Black Church Studies. We, we don't do it as big as uh, Alfred Street with y'all seminary uh, Saturdays, but we, oh, we need to take a page from y'all's book. But, um, but please, come through, check us out, please. And this is a message to one and all, please. Thank you. Um, there was a word that was on the screen that I don't know how to pronounce. I believe it's historicity. Yeah, historicity, historicity. yeah, yeah. Historicity, mm -hmm. okay. And um, when, because I didn't know what it meant or had, I never saw it before, I looked it up. And I looked up the difference between history, historical, his, um, his, his, history, historical. History, yeah, yeah. History, okay. And um, the definition was the process of separating fact from legend 
and recreating how exactly history is played out. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to, in the context of, I guess, what we're learning this morning, I wrote my question, as we try to grapple being part of and part from physically and in some instances spiritually, as we go about our own day-to-day -day circumstances, how do we approach and reconcile what we consider past atrocities with today's information and understanding? Mm -hmm. So some things that we thought we knew, we understand that there, they may, mm -hmm. it, it may not be exactly as we thought we knew it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right, this is, thank you, sister, thank you. First of all, that's what we do, or that's, what, that's the way we do this, right? right. Because first of all, the, the way we become misled is because we're misfed, right? If information is food for thought, right? right. If, if somebody's giving you junk food, make sure, you know, I, I got what I need, right? I'm gonna go for the, the real deal. I'm gonna go for a home-cooked meal rather than, you know, slop that you're giving me, right? So yes, historicity is exactly that. <clears throat> what I'm saying, you know, uh, taking language from uh, Howard Thurman, but when, when you put Jesus on a shelf, right? You know, like we just got out of the holidays, right? You had that elf on the shelf thing or whatever, right? When we put Jesus on a shelf, right? And don't engage Jesus. Don't realize that Jesus was, wasn't just God's son, but Mary's baby boy. And the things that Jesus went through, right? Wasn't all pristine and purified, right? That Jesus got angry, right? And had a righteous rage, right? You know, when he's flipping the table and the, uh, the money changers in the, in the temple, right? right? He's demonstrating that, okay, right? He's not trying to be violent for violence sake, but he's like, look, this is inappropriate and this needs to change. Get this mess out of here, right? When he goes to Nazareth, right? Back to Nazareth, I should say, right? You know, he was straight out of Nazareth, right? But, <laughs> but when he goes back home, and you know, he's trying to perform miracles and he's trying to bless the people in the land and he can perform no miracles in his hometown, right? Because they keep saying, come on, you marry, you marry Joseph's boy. Come, psh, what you doing up in here, right? Don't tell me that you've not experienced or, or extent, right? So when we think about the glory of Jesus, right? To the sister's point, when we think about the glory of Jesus, Sometimes we lose sight of the story, the facts of Jesus' life, right? It was hard to be Jesus and to follow Jesus, right? When Jesus is saying that, you know, birds of the air have nests and foxes has holes, but the Son of Man, Son of God, has nowhere to lay his head, he's talking about what it means to be deprived of a home, either in a literal sense, right? He couldn't get that HOA uh, paid off or, right? You know, he couldn't get that, you know, his, his credit was bad, bad or what? Or the, the, the more spiritual crisis of that, right? That I am in a land that I do not have governmental or sovereign control over, right? The Romans run stuff in my home, in my hood, right? So. So like I said before, when, when we think about the glory and you, yes, yes, focus and emphasize the glory of God, right? Right, that is personified, embodied in Jesus. But we also got to recognize, you know, uh, um, one of the uh, pioneering womanist uh, scholars, uh, Jackie Grant, talks about white women's Christ and black women's Jesus, right? Right, this idea that, right, Jesus, right? The Jesus that I cry out to, right? knows what it means to be uh, run, in, uh, run into the wrong uh, uh, law enforcement officers, be put through an unjust uh, criminal justice system, be, uh, I'm gonna use this word even though I despise it, um, you know, charged on trumped up uh, charges, <laughs> okay, right? And then have to watch his mama cry when he dies an untimely death, right? All right, you know, that's, the, the Jesus that we're connecting to, right? That's the real Jesus, right? As much as history will, will you know, to use another expression, whitewash, um, uh, try to, to um, sanitize the story, it's that real deal story that we always gotta tap into, all right? Okay. Well, y'all got a break. No, she has a question over there. Please, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. No worries. Um, I just wanted to 
um, ask, first of all, this is just a wonderful conversation. And um, I want to thank Alpha Street Baptist Church for always having the courage to bring us into the power and the transformational um, existence of Christ as we ask these difficult questions. Amen. Um, Amen. I, as we look at what the black church's response is um, and getting educated about what our relationship is with um, the genocide that is happening against Palestinian people um, at the hands of the government of Israel, I wanted to get your um, education and your take on the description of Semitic, and maybe I don't understand it well or how it's being defined. Mm -hmm. But when I look in the dictionary, it says Semitic describes a group of languages, including Hebrew and Arabic, mm -hmm. as well as the people who speak those languages. Am I wrong in understanding that it's not just Jewish people who are Semitic, but it is also yeah. the Palestinian people? Mm -hmm. And. You are not wrong. Let me just say that quickly. You're not wrong. And if that is correct, that it has been co-opted and incorporated in the propaganda that our country, the United States government, whenever we speak out against one mm -hmm. community of Semitic people, that we're being anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. But when we ignore that other population mm -hmm. of Semitic people, then no one speaks up. So I'd like to... Thank you. That's, that's too much praise for me right now. So I'm <laughs> Take all the praise. You I'm, deserve it. You I'm going to go it. back, but this is my burning question, and I, I'd like to thank those that I shared breakfast with because they aid me on, and also <laughs> Reverend Judy when I asked her to do pick up my, my, uh, my bucket of water and carry it for me. She placed it firmly back in my hands. So... <laughs> Here I go. But that was a strong hand on that bucket. So it's Here a good I go, thing. Reverend Judy. Um, <laughs> help me out if I trip up. But um, when I read this quote from the Egyptian president, um, Nasir, back in 1958, he was being interviewed. And President Nasir said that these Jews who came in back to the land of Palestine mm -hmm. after the United Nations determined that they would have a homeland in Palestine, President Nasir of Egypt mm -hmm. said, these Jews will never be accepted because they left here mm -hmm. white and they, re uh, no, excuse me, they left here black and they returned white. Mm. And, I, and I get the sense that what he meant was not just by the complexion, because mm. imper, imperial nations mm -hmm. have always created literally a middle class by the raping of indigenous women, creating this wedge class so mm -hmm. that if you have the skin that's closest to those that are the, the um, imperial nations, that mm. you have privilege. All right. But... We see it here in our own country. Mm -hmm. But with him making that comment, it seems that it was vilified um, by the information given by our own United States government mm -hmm. where they labeled him an anti-Semite. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that's all I got to say. <laughs> <I'm gonna> go <laughs> Thank you, sister. You sit. What you said, you said wonderfully, you said well. One thing I'll pick up because uh, we are touching on this on the um, material that follows our break. Um, but one thing I will say, while we're still in the kind of historical and biblical uh, space, is the idea that in, within the, the first chapter of the book of Exodus, right, when the writer, the chronicler of that, that text is, is laying the groundwork for understanding Israel's the House of Israel's arrival in, in Egypt, right? The idea that Moses could enter into Pharaoh's household and be indistinguishable, unrecognizable from the, the royal family of Egypt, right? We, we lose track of the fact that, okay, a lot of the, the kind of racial identification or distinctions that we make in the 21st century, right, did not, I'm not saying they did not exist, right? But the idea that, okay, so if the Israelites could resemble and be recognized equally with the Egyptians, but yet 
This wedge was, was drawn between them, as I stated before, where you had a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, right? This wasn't a godly thing, right? This wasn't a divine situation that split the Egyptians and the Israelites, right? This was a governmental, a political, a socio or a social or cultural thing that drew the wedge between, right? The haves and the have nots, the, the makers and the takers, right? I mean, however you want to split the split the, the notion, right? So as the sister was saying, right, and I'm gonna repeat myself again, right? Some of the problems that we're dealing with in this world, God didn't do. God didn't have any hand in making it. Now, God can have a great hand in breaking the, the you know, bondage and oppression and trauma and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah, God is the remedy for the problem in some cases that God did not create. So what we gotta deal with now as we uh, return from break in a few minutes is um, talking about how do we even make sense of something like this, right? So thank you all, thank you. are online the handout is on the description link the description page on the, page on the YouTube page under the description on the YouTube page greetings everyone welcome back welcome back I want to be a, a proper steward of our time together because uh, we don't have long and we're gonna go strong. So uh, I'm thankful for everybody being in position, even those of us uh, joining online. Uh, and speaking of the online presence and, and engagement, um, we got, you know, I'm not Cat Williams, but it seems like I got social media going up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> woo, okay, all right. Truth needs no motivation, there we go. Uh, all right, see, you know, I think somebody tuned into Club Shay Shay, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> many, many millions. Um, <laughs> no, no, keeping it sober and serious. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but, you know, people of God can have a good laugh, too. Um, uh, there was a question online uh, asking in uh, uh, quite, uh, I think, uh, right fashion about the origins of the current c conflict between Israel and Hamas, especially in terms of Hamas as a, a terrorist organization having uh, led an attack against uh, Israel on October 7th of, of 2023. And so, um, you know, working in accordance with, with the spirit, uh, that's actually how I wanted to uh, pick up our, our conversation. So flesh and blood didn't reveal that to the, um, the sender of that question. When we're talking about uh, you know, and to say to uh, say a word about the Israel-Hamas conflict and uh, where what it means for the the modern state of Israel as it's nestled in this crux of the Holy Land as a region. That we, what we were talking about before break, which for many of us, right? Um, I know I've grown up with always this this hovering kind of um, state of mind about the Middle East, right? It's right, in the middle of something, right? But we don't talk about the Middle West, okay? So, all right, you know, in terms of just uh, mental balance and things, but also that as a, as a region of the world, right, um, many of my folks who are biblical scholars, who are anthropologists and, and uh, scholars of the like, historians of, of the ancient world, talk about it being uh, situated in what's known as the Afro-Asiatic plate, right? So as a, a strip of land that is a connector between Asia, the entirety of Asia, and Africa. You know, so part of the intellectual as well as political project of making it look as if this is a quote unquote no man's land, right? And, and uh, we're gonna wrestle with that, right? That it's a space unto itself that doesn't connect and doesn't have any uh, um, kind of claim or ownership to the histories of, of the peoples of color who inhabit it, especially as the, the one sister was um, raising up, the idea that the Semitic peoples, right, you know, and we can uh, take that all the way through to the origins of the word uh, Semitic, right, Shem, the, the children of Shem, right, that that land, this land that we're talking about, the Holy Land, has always been inhabited by 
at least three faith traditions, right? Many of the other ones got exterminated or, or um, were asked to remove themselves from their place of residence. But when we talk about the Abrahamic uh, faith traditions, right, right, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam being chief among them. But what I also want to uh, suggest and invoke here, I uh, hope the, the, um, the slide will show up, um, the, the idea that, and I'm borrowing an expression from uh, um, Winston Churchill of all folk, but um, you know, he, he made the argument about places and spaces such as the Holy Land that they produce more history than they could possibly consume, right? That what jumps off in these places, right? You know, and, and throughout human history, we've seen many of these places used to be uh, um, what we called uh, Eastern Europe. It used to be what we called um, the Troubles in Ireland. Used to be what we were dealing with in terms of the Rwandan genocide. Used to be what we would refer to in, in terms of uh, apartheid era South Africa, right? Right. It used to be what we talked about in Jim and Jane Crow's South. Um, the crisis of, of government that worked against the people who inhabited the land, the spaces and places where they called home. And so now as the whole world is watching the events in this troubled region unfold, especially since October 8th, 2023, right? Not talking about the terrorist attack, but talking about how the government of Israel responded to the terrorist attack. Because I, I found it both uh, chilling and also um, revealing that the current uh, Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, referred to that event as their September 11th. Okay, and um, what we, us, we always must understand, right? It's not about the terrible and bad things that happened to us, but how do we react and respond to the terrible and bad things that have occurred? So if you follow that logic, that reasoning that Netanyahu is trying to advance, right? For the United States, right? We're, and you know, I'm, once again, I'm not trying to tap dance on anybody's 501c3, but um, but from a, a scholarly perspective, as a historian looking back now, if the ways in which the United States government pers pursued its goals in the days, the months, and ultimately the years now, more than 20 years since the terrorist attack. On, on September 11th, right? Did we do it the right way, the best way possible, right? Two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? And there are many people, some who took on the nation's garment and, and served in the military and went overseas in the hopes of, of trying to make the world a better, more peaceful place. And some of them are questioning and concerned about what did we accomplish? What did we achieve in, in that mission? If, not try, once again, not trying to um, uh, deviate from our conversation here, but if lessons could be learned from how the United States conducted itself in the aftermath of, of that terrible uh, tragedy, right, could be extended to our uh, um, allies, our friends in Israel, especially when they're dealing with a non-state uh, um, uh, actor, right? Um, not to get uh, too much in the weeds on uh, uh, diplomacy and, and political science, but Hamas is not an elected government, right? There is an actual uh, political uh, um, entity in, in Gaza and, and the related uh, Palestinian era areas known as the Palestinian Authority, but they are disrespected. They are not acknowledged by the people on the ground, right? You know, I'll share a little bit of my truth. Um, I was born and raised, uh, you know, up the road on, on 95 in a uh, little place called uh, Paris in New Jersey, right? Uh, just, uh, okay, all right, recognize, uh, all right, Garden State all the way. Um, and who, <laughs> and uh, um, in, in the, um, the day and time in which I came up, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, it was the era of uh, crack uh, in the 70s and 80s, especially in the, the 80s, and there were, uh, individuals, uh, um, street corner pharmaceutical uh, um, uh, experts, um, 
right? When nobody else in the neighborhood had income coming in or, or had a, a legitimate uh, leadership of our community, right? It was these individuals, right? You know, they, they were the ones who sponsored uh, turkey giveaways during the holidays, right? They were the ones, not, not your local uh, uh, financial institution, not your local politician, right? They were the ones that you went to when mama couldn't make the rent. They were the ones that you went to when, when uh, Junebug got locked up. They were the ones that you went to when uh, you know, family health emergencies occurred, right? So what I'm suggesting here, and this is not to excuse uh, Hamas in any way, shape, or form, but if we believe that nature abhors a vacuum, right? You know, um, uh, the, the great North African theologian, uh, um, St. Augustine of Hippo, right? Yeah, he was black, y'all. Uh, okay, and had more confessions than Usher. Uh, okay, all right. Um, all right, uh, Augustine tells us, Augustine tells us that we all have a God-sized hole in us waiting to be filled, right? Waiting for and, and reaching out for that thing that, that will make us complete and whole again, right? But until that time, a whole bunch of mess will, will, will occupy that space. You know, you'd be a shopaholic or, or addicted to a, a certain kind of uh, narcotic substances or, or looking for love in all the wrong places or, or think that violence is the only solution to what, what uh, grieves you and, and uh, um, what, what uh, troubles you. So in this way, shape, and form, the Palestinians, in the absence of an effective governing body are reaching out to folk and lifting up folk who otherwise would not be an acceptable solution, right? So we also at least have to be that, that level of empathetic to them or, or recognize what they're dealing with, right? Because they are, as Thurman is saying, people with their backs against the wall, right? So they're not getting any love, they're not getting any respect, they're not getting any, uh, um, any response from the elected officials so they've turned now to someone or, or a group of folk that they don't fully understand or don't fully have their best interests at heart, right? And also, let me just say this, and I'll, I'll speak more in my, my actual remarks here, but the idea that, you know, in the wake of what happened on October 8th, 2023, tens of thousands of Palestinians have been killed in the carpet bombing of Gaza, many of them children. Hundreds of thousands, if not, we're now approaching uh, upwards of millions of folks, have been displaced and forced out of their homes. The Israeli government's decision to cut off food, water, electricity, and humanitarian aid, not even, I'm not even getting to the point of talking about refusing to even accept or embrace ceasefire or, or uh, pause to, to military action, right? I'm just talking about the stripping away of bare necessities, right? That this has led to a captive civilian population that threatens not only to worsen a growing uh, um, humanitarian crisis, but it could also further harden generations. Talk about this, generations of Palestinians, right? When you're seeing children who are now growing up in a war, there's actually um, the, the U UN and other uh, um, outside officials have now a designation of um, children without families, right? That the, the decimation of, of Gaza has been so intense, right? That if they are able to rescue the children, right? Orphan no longer is an acceptable term, right? Like they can't even uh, designate these, these children as orphans because like, it's not even just the loss of parents, they got no family. Right? Like an entire level of generation of, of uh, coexistence has just been wiped off the map. And yet these children are now, if they survive this hardship, what thoughts are they going to have about the possibility of, of living side by side? Right? Okay, you get it. Thank you. I don't, all right. So when we're wrestling with this, when we're wrestling with what that means for future generations and the, the furtherance of this conflict, when we're wrestling with how this may also erode global support for Israel, right? Because if they would do this, knowing that the whole world is watching, right? And also, right, as, as uh, has been said and expressed, doing this with either a wink and a nod or, or a bear hug, from the United States, right? Now they're doing this in our name, okay? 
This openly plays into the hands of Israel's enemies and also undermines long-term efforts to try to achieve peace and stability, not only in that region, like I said, this magical, mystical region we call the Middle East, but also worldwide. If we can't do it there, in the places where places and spaces where Jesus walked, how are we going to make it possible anywhere else on the planet? All right. So let me see. Hopefully this. All right. So when Thurman, because once again, uh, circling back, right, Thurman writes his classic book in 1949, right, in the shadow of the creation of the modern state of Israel. We do have on record that by 1963, he and his beloved wife, Sue Thurman, make a trip to Israel, right, and with this, right, you know, especially occurring uh, in December of 63, so right around the Christmas season, right, what Thurman notes at that time, you know, roughly 15 or so years later, Israel is an unhappy land, right? He's noting that while deeply sympathetic and deeply connected and committed to um, the existence of the state, modern state of Israel, he's also starting to witness the tension, the problem, the, the growing crisis in the land, right, between the existence of um, the, as the, as the sister uh, rightly mentioned, right, the, the Israelis, not the Israelites, the Israelis coming back into the land and now feeling that they are entitled, right? They are no longer, they, they are not the house guests, they are the homeowners, okay? But, the inconvenience of the indigenous population still being here. It's like, well, won't y'all move out? Why don't y'all go? Um, and now wrestling with this, for Thurman, as he's looking at this, right, he's looking at this from the vantage point of, okay, how do we make sense of, all right, the fulfillment of, of biblical promise, right, for the children of Israel, but now this is, also a punishing reality for the Palestinians, right? Uh, the writer, uh, Ilan uh, Pop, you know, writes in this book, uh, The Ethnic Cleansing of, of Palestine, right? Let me just uh, make a note, right? There've been a lot of uh, um, scandalous uh, um, uh, events of recent dates about plagiarism and things like that. So I'm, you know, I don't wanna give a whole lot of words on screen to you, but, <laughs> Ain't nobody coming for my words. I'm gonna let you know where I got this stuff from. You can fact check me all you want, okay? So, okay. I hope you have a library card or, or internet access. Go get it, okay? So, yes, uh, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Uh, um, Pop uh, makes mention of this issue of what happens when we have the emphasis of the creation of the state of Israel and everything that the state of Israel had to go go through, as we'll talk about momentarily, to exist on the planet Earth and survive to, to this day, versus what is occurring in terms of the erasure of, of the, the trauma and the hardship of, of the Palestinian people, right? One should not beget the other, right? One should not forget the other, but one should also not beget the other. Okay, so why does this matter? Right, the event of the Nakba, right? And what we're talking about here is um, in Arabic, the word Nakba refers to um, a disaster or catastrophe, right? So for many of the folks who, who suffered through this, um, this trauma in the, in the origins of the, the modern state of Israel, they, they come to this reality where what we always have to acknowledge is that the modern state of Israel was born in the heart of war. And what I mean by that is the year before its founding in 1948, there was a petition partition plan produced by the United Nations, the newly uh, created organization after the Second World War. And as this growing uh, organization was trying to create world peace in, in a world that had been ravaged after uh, you know, um, dealing with the Nazis and the Italian fascists and the Japanese and other threats to um, the world community. This idea that quite literally, the, the United Nations was trying to carve out a space, and this is where this uh, troublesome and, and very uh, controversial term uh, comes into political language, 
<coughs> the narrow stretch of land from the Ri Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea and trying to create two states, okay? All right, this, this was something that was born out of the Second World War. This was born out of all the confusion and chaos of that moment. And to designate both of those states, one Arab and one Jewish, right? The, the surrounding uh, Arab countries rejected the plan, and as did the Palestinians who were the, the current inhabitants of the land, right? The United Nations, right, think about this, right, was trying to, okay, so this is like if Joe Biden was trying to, to raise taxes in Canada, right? Do you have the, the authority or legitimate power to do so, right? Right. The, when we have questions about dem democracy and you know valid, legitimate government, right? These are the kind of questions, right? Can people who've been living on the land for for generations, for, in some cases for centuries or or even millennia, for thousands of years, be told overnight, "Y'all gotta go," right? Gets to step in, or you know what? You you all never thought that you know. Uh, have you ever considered, you know, splitting your country in half? Have you? Have you? Right, you know, do you need all this? Okay, now, yes, the United Nations was trying to take care of one problem in terms of the survivors of the Holocaust and trying to find a humane solution for, for that situation. But then what I'm arguing, and, you know, we'll go into a little depth in this, is the idea that in order to solve one problem, ought not automatically lead to creating four or five more, okay? But yet, in, in that uh, situation, when uh, the, the partition plan was announced uh, by May 15th of, of 20, oh, sorry, 14, 1947, uh, you know, a, a conflict with uh, four neighboring uh, Arab nations uh, um, erupted, right? And the Jewish uh, um, state, the settlers, who would then become known as Israelis, saw the ensuing war, which they, they ultimately won, as the beginning of an existential fight for survival, much as I mentioned from uh, um, Thurman's writings, right, that, that, not, that notion is survival possible, right, right? They're thinking about this as a day one factor, a day one reality, right? They're, so they're thinking, especially coming out of the shadow of the Holocaust and now going through this, this regional conflict with their, their Arab neighbors, right? <clears throat> they're seeing this as the start of a long rolling war of liberation. Okay. So here on the screen, what you see, right, to put this in visual terms, right, you know, because, uh, you know, what we tend to do in our classroom is know that not everybody, you know, uh, appreciates or absorbs information the same way. So, just to give you a, a you know, the old saying, a picture tells a thousand words, right? This, this progression of maps, you know, looking from before the, the partition plan happened, that was the state of uh, Palestine in uh, 1946 on your far left. The day that the plan was instituted, or, or, you know, the era that the plan was instituted by 1947, you're already starting to see, you know, the fading away of the Palestinian population, but it's, they don't just go away, right? You know, they don't turn to steam and just go poof, right? They're now being uh, concentrated and consolidated in, in the darker zones. So then by 1967, roughly 20 years later, of course, but also after much external conflict for the state of Israel, but also um, a lot of political maneuvers within the nation of Israel, right, we're seeing the further uh, um, erosion and shrinking of Palestinian property to eventually about uh, now 14 years ago, right? Th and this was obviously long before um, all the terrorism and, and the um, trauma that we're dealing with right now. But you're seeing what happened here during the period where many folks were, were talking about, especially during uh, the Obama presidency, many folks were talking about the Arab Spring talking about, you know, if y'all remember this, right, um, events in uh, the heart of Egypt in Tahir Square, talking about uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Libya, right, and the possibility that democracy would uh, be, be expanding and rising in many of these places, right, still got some work to do with Saudi Arabia and Iran, but okay, 
Um, we can touch on that if you will. But in the moment where we were supposedly witnessing a greater flourishing of, of Arab democracy in 2010, this is what the Palestinians were dealing with, right? The creation, or, or at that point in time, um, the first flowering of the Palestinian Authority was during this period of 2010. And this was the best that most of the Palestinians could expect at that time, right? Now, something else I wanted to bring into the conversation is that um, one of the brokers, one of the, the folks who was uh, chiefly responsible for even achieving any measure of uh, um, peace in the region at that time, uh, by the late 40s and early 1950s, was uh, um, Dr. Ralph Bunch. And if you don't know this individual, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's what we used to refer to back in the day as a phenomenal Negro. Um, you know, right? Not only was he a, a star student athlete at UCLA, but he also graduated Phi Beta Kappa, right? Then he went on to do his work at, at Harvard. Then, you know, because, you know, this brother had more degrees than a sick person's thermometer, right? Then he goes overseas to the London School of Economics. You know, he's studying politics. He's studying, studying economics, diplomacy. Then he comes back home. He's doing his, his work at Harvard, right? but then would also ultimately become a, a scholar and a professor right down the way at HU once again. Name keeps coming up, all right? Um, but then, fancy this, right? You know, at a time in the 1930s and 40s when black folks could only clean up at the State Department, he's being hired and recruited to work in the State Department. He's taken what's known as a, a desk at the State Department, and he's doing a great job, mostly uh, concentrated on the Caribbean and uh, um, some, some parts of uh, the African continent. Then with the newly formed, newly created United Nations, he's solicited by the, Un United, uh, the UN Gen uh, Secretary General of the, of the time to come work for the United Nations on this very hot, hot topic of uh, the Middle East, right? So Dr. Bunch, right, as one of, if not the only African Americans of, of his era, being brought into foreign relations and, and uh, international diplomacy. He's brought into this conflict, and I would dare argue, you know, it wasn't just, right, you know, he's not an affirmative action hire, Right? There was nothing affirmative about any action that folks were taking during Jim and Jane Crow, all right? But the idea that he had a, a sensitivity, let's say, like he understood, okay, what, what it felt like to be, oh, I don't know, right? Uh, a raisin in the sun, what it felt like to be, you know, left out, left behind, right? The least of these, right? Even though, like I said, he had an exceptional and extraordinary resume, he still saw things much in a much better and maybe even possibly more humane way than many of the folks who were traditionally hired by the State Department, who, you know, uh, let's, let's just uh, call it what it is, right? The, the folks who oftentimes work in that uh, um, branch of US government, who look their nose down on uh, people of color in other parts of the world, or might have a more prejudicial view of um, the, the conflicts or the concerns of people on the ground, everyday people. So when Dr. Bunch is brought into this scenario, right, he's able to broker a deal amongst the, the, the warring factions in the, in the region and try to um, stabilize the situation for Israel in those early years, and for his efforts, he was actually awarded by 1950 the Nobel Peace Prize, okay? Which was the first time that any African American had, had uh, received the award as well, right? Wouldn't be the last, y'all. All right, thank, thankfully. Um, but this notion that as black folk, that we don't have skin in the game, pardon the pun, all right, that we are not part of this conversation or that we've never had a space or place to, to engage in this work or, or think these thoughts about how to literally make the world a better, more peaceful place, right? It wasn't the first time, y'all. It shouldn't be the last, okay? Ah, uh, yes. 
what I also want to lift up here, and uh, um, the gentleman you see on the screen here is a Palestinian Arab Christian, um, a late great scholar by the name of Edward Said. And um, um, if, if we think about decolonizing or, or post-colonial uh, thought and activity, activism, right, he's one of the champions. He was one of the first to do this thing, right? Not the only one, but one of the first. And he talks about, uh, once again, going back to the sister who made the comment about anti-Semitism. He, in, in his thinking, in his scholarship, identifies that even though we put Arabs and, and Jews against each other as, as automatic enemies, right? There is a secret sharing, he called it, between anti-Semitism and uh, Islamophobia, right? Some of the very same people now who are standing back watching uh, Israel and Hamas blow each other up, right? They're doing this, right, much like you would watch a, a football game, right? Because they're, they're like, see what they do, right? The other, right? They're, they're looking at those folk destroy and, and, and dehumanize one another. And what we think about the end game is that who would it profit if these two keep going at it and, and take each other out, right? To go on further, and I, I lift this up, um, to the, the same extent that Said is talking about the secret sharer of, um, that the, the, at root, you know, the same kind of hatred or, or dehumanization that, that drives anti-Semitism is also at work in Islamophobia. He talks about this idea that um, many of the same folk who are wrestling with this right now, they're thinking about this in terms of hoping that the conflict appears intractable because it is a contest over the same land by two peoples who always believed that they had valid title to it and who hoped that the other side would in time just give up or go away, right? Right, so they're not trying to think about what's best for the other person. They're not trying to think about how can we peacefully coexist. They're just like, why don't you just die already, right? Now, that's a mighty low place to go in your own spirit, in your own way of thinking, when the best result in your interaction with another human being or group is, y'all just gotta die already. Right? No, and seriously, like if we've gotten to that breaking point, if we've gotten to that threshold, right? When we got to the threshold where at this point, you don't care about your kids or another group's kids, that yes. You're talking about now uh, something that's fundamentally broken in your soul. Okay. What I also want to lift up here, too, is, you know, and um, once again, another uh, contributor, another uh, um, leader in the space of, of decolonization and uh, postcolonial uh, thought and activism, uh, the psychiatrist uh, Franz Fanon, right? He talked about you know, when he was in university that one of his professors taught him that at first thought it seemed strange that the anti-Semite's outlook should be related to that of the Negrophobe. It was my philosophy professor, a native of the Antilles, who recalled the fact to me one day, whenever you hear someone abuse Jews, pay attention because he's talking about you. And I found that he was universally right, by which I mean that it was, I was answerable in my body and in my heart for what was done to my brother or sister. Later, I realized that he meant, quite simply, an anti-Semite is inevitably anti-Negro, right? The folks who hate other folks will eventually somehow turn their attention to you, right? May not be, right, it, it may be a long day, but it will happen one day, right? So by being able to, um, rest comfortably within a crisis where folk, now in this case, um, folks who've been denied and deprived their, their political rights and freedoms, folks who've been denied and deprived the opportunity to have some, some impact and influence in shaping their shared destiny, right? Their determination for the promised land, the, the, the holy land, right? When you have a political uh, apparatus in place that believes that the only way it can survive is by denying you 
your, your freedom, your justice, your equality, your dignity, right? That is not anything that we should be supporting, right? Now, what I lift up here is also um, coming from uh, the, uh, the rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, a colleague and, and a um, fellow uh, struggler with uh, Dr. King. And when he talked about this in 1973, he, he just said, in regard to cruelties committed in the name of a free society, some are guilty while all are responsible, right? The call is coming from inside the house, y'all. Now, yeah, BB. Um, but yes, this, this issue for Netanyahu, right? This idea that he is operating from a playbook that he has long since held, right? That the idea that when he first came to national uh, recognition and power uh, in the late 90s, right? These were points of view that, that he still uh, upheld and embraced, that he believed that they could turn the, the Gaza Strip, the, the area that's currently um, most contested in this struggle into a land without people. And when he said people, he's not just being like vague or whatever. He's talking about Palestinians, y'all, right? The, the idea that the military strategy that's currently underway is, I'm going to borrow an expression. Um, you know, back in the 1960s, um, I'm borrowing this from James Baldwin, right? He talked about, you know, what they used to call urban renewal, gentrification, right? that urban renewal was really Negro removal, okay, right? And so once again, like if you think what's old is new again, right? What we're seeing here on a worldwide stage, right? Bombing and destroying Gaza without regard to, to uh, um, any possibility of survivors, right? right? Using a sledgehammer that, rather than a scalpel. Like if you're really seriously trying to take out terrorists and, and their leadership or whatever, just blowing up everything, right? Innocent people to the point where, and once again with uh, Netanyahu at the, at the head of this government, right? The idea that the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, had just a few weeks ago shot uh, three Israelis, right? No questions asked, right? They had a shoot first policy. Well, okay, so, that is when you have lost the moral high ground as, as a government, right? If you said that you, you're trying to live and operate better than the terrorists, but you're doing what the terrorists are doing, right? Now you're killing your own and calling it, I mean, you know, you're calling it, right? This is our right as, as the government, as a state, right? right? Do as we say and not as we do. Also, um, let me give you this little tidbit. Now, um, going back to the summer of I guess this would be 2022, yes, 20, the year before. So you know, I've only had a, a couple of cups of coffee. I'm only good after my first gallon. Uh, okay, all right. Um, uh, my wife and I, we were uh, part of an outfit uh, uh, along with a, a Jewish colleague of ours, uh, David Nelson, um, and we were working with an institution to try and deal with um, diversity, you know, uh, we call this a bad word around these parts, right? But diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, DEI. Um, we were trying to work with this institution, uh, a Jewish, an American Jewish institution, right, that has a uh, presence on both sides uh, here in the US and Israel. We were trying to work with them on dealing with their DEI issues, right, of which they had quite a few. And we were scheduled to go to Israel uh, um, to, you know, uh, put feet on the ground in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and such. We could not get there because of, of uh, protests and uprisings against the Israeli government by Israelis who were rejecting Bibi Netanyahu's um, right-wing governments trying to grab power in their, uh, their version of the Supreme Court, right? right? Extra constitutional measures that he was taking against the people of Israel, right? So, and it was unsafe, untenable for us to go there then because of things that he was doing to his people, right? So what we also have to be mindful and I would dare say fearful of is that Netanyahu and, and uh, folks who are in his circle might be using uh, some of the circumstances of the, the current events now 
to hold on to power that they would normally and naturally lose if a, fair, a free and fair election was to happen in Israel, right? Of which, of course, most of the Palestinians could not uh, participate in, right? So this would be a rejection or a renunciation by his own folk for what he has done to the nation of Israel, right? But then there is this issue of scapegoating, right? Using folk, and that's biblical, y'all. I'm not making up the term uh, scapegoat. There was actually uh, scapegoats in the Bible, right? right? They, they would bear the burden of the people, right? All the sins, all the, the problems of the people would be poor little goats. <laughs> they didn't ask for this, they didn't choose it. But, it, you know, but they, you know, so the goats got got, and then suddenly, like, you know, the, the nation would go on and act as if nothing happened. Well, we're seeing that modern day uh, rendition of that. Okay. But even, even in the midst of, of these kind of uh, um, controversial and heady uh, political waters, folk have to tell the truth to shame the devil. Um, one such voice uh, from within um, the highest branches of, of Israeli government was the former speaker of the Israeli Knesset. That's like their version of Congress. It's um, the, the Israeli parliament, right? Avram Berg, he addressed this situation and he said, um, you know, trying to, trying to talk to his, his own folk, right? As someone who had been a political leader, who had been anointed and appointed, you know, and entrusted with what all political leaders are supposed to do, the well-being of, of your people. We fight to break the vicious cycle, which was our portion since Esau, Pharaoh, Goliath, Adrian, Vespasian, Klemensky, Hitler, and the rest of the supervillains. But the more we fight them, the more we feel heavy-handed like them, like Esau, we have forgotten the obligations that our earlier generations took upon themselves. We treat them, talking about the Palestinians, we treat them as if we have never vowed in Hillel, the elders, a brilliant summation of the Torah, do not do unto others what is hateful to you. We hated it and we are doing it, sometimes much too joyously. Is it any wonder no one wants to be our friend anymore when we practice expropriations, injustice in military courts, abuse, roadblocks, food shortages? This was in 2008, y'all. He didn't see or write anything about what happened yesterday. This is well over 15 years ago that this book dropped, right? Food shortages and worst of all, contempt for Arab life, okay? So the issue here, and you know, I don't wanna to put too much uh, dip on the chip, but the notion that David should never become Goliath, right? The problem of, okay, if you take on state power, and I'm, I'm lifting up here from a, a French philosopher, because that's all they be making is French philosophers, uh, Michel Foucault, right? Um, you know, hey, you know, bread, wine, philosophers, okay. But, um, but the idea that, um, there is this notion of biopower, about the power to choose who lives and who dies, right? To promote certain groups to have the best of life while also preventing others from having any life at all, right? And that is where we find ourselves because we should not confuse, uh, to borrow from uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, we should not confuse God and government. All right, yeah, I'm gonna take you back like a rocking chair. Um, the idea that government is supposed to help you achieve and succeed in this world, right? But it does so with our permission, right? With our tax dollars, with our votes, with, with our peaceful participation in the system, right? right? If you do good by us, we do good by you. It's a mutual thing, right? But government does not get to exist unquestioned. Government should not, operate in a realm that is beyond our understanding, right? That's, that's the space that God inhabits, right? Not your local uh, uh, city hall, not the Senate or the, con or, or the House of Representatives, and certainly not the White House or Supreme Court, right? No, if you're doing the people's work, the people need to understand how it's working, right? If God, you know, I've seen God's job and I don't want it. I'm not trying, you know, let God be God all day, every day, and twice on Sunday, right? But the stuff that we can manage and control, we need to take care of that, okay? 
so, so this notion that what we're witnessing here since the, the terrible terrorist attack of October 7, 2023, are governments trying to assert and assume godlike power, divine power. And you know, people of, good, of true faith and good conscience should be able to call that out. Now, once again, uh, returning and revisiting uh, uh, Thurman's uh, classic book, um, uh, Jesus and Disinherited, uh, by the tail end of that book, he wrestles with three, count them, three issues or concerns that um, face everyone, right? What he called the hounds of hell, fear, deception, and hate. Now, Thurman writes about this within the lives of all the oppressed worldwide from here across the sea and back again, right? That fear becomes the safety device with which the oppressed surround themselves in order to give some measure of protection from complete nervous collapse, right? That sometimes fear is all you got, right? It's your blanket. It's your best friend, right? The oppressed often have relied on, on deception strategically that and this, these are uh, Thurman's words. Deception is perhaps the oldest of, of all techniques by which the weak have protected themselves against the strong. Throughout the ages, at all stages of sentient activity, the weak have survived by fooling the strong, right? That the only way we get by and get through this world, and I'm, I'm especially shouting out sisters, right? Where, where y'all understand that sometimes you gotta play to somebody's ego, or whatever, or let them think they had the idea even though, you know, sometimes ideas, you know, in, in certain people's heads are where, where they go to die a, a sad, lonely death, right? Okay, but you got to feed them the notion, right? Say, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm glad we came up with this. Okay, okay. And then last but not least, hate. Hate serves as the final strategy to overcome subjugated status. That, and I'm quoting again from Thurman, hate is another of the hounds of hell that dog the footsteps of the disinherited in season and out of season. During times of war, hatred becomes quite respectable, even though it has, has to masquerade often under the guise of patriotism. All right. Once again, Thurman's writing this in 1949, y'all. Right? But it, it's a lesson that we need to learn repeatedly. Right? Everybody waving the flag is not your friend. Right? Everyone who says, oh yeah, we got to get them. We got to get them. Right? Well, they are them today, but but they could also include us tomorrow, okay? So what we're wrestling with here is, okay, the centrality of, of Thur Thurman's vision about the religion of Jesus, right? And, and the love ethic within that. So I'm quoting here. What then is the word of the religion of Jesus to those who stand with their backs against the wall? There must be the clearest possible understanding of the anatomy of the issues facing them. They must recognize fear, deception, hatred, each for what it is. Once having done this, they must learn how to destroy these or to render themselves immune to their domination. In so great an undertaking, it will become increasingly clear that the contradictions of life are not ultimate. The disinherited will know for themselves that there is a spirit at work in life and in the hearts of people which is committed to overcoming the world. For the privileged and the underprivileged alike, if the individual puts at the disposal of the, of the spirit, the needful dedication and discipline, he or she can live effectively in the chaos of the present, the high destiny of a child of God. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And we actually have some time if y'all got some questions. on it in your um, next to final comments. Um, and what the question is raising is that whole issue of neutrality. Like, can, can, there, can you be neutral in the midst of a situation like this? Thank you. Um, no. Was that, was that uh, detailed enough? No, I'm sorry. Um, no, neutrality. Neutral now, what we've seen on the opposite side of this, especially with some of our folks in, in uh, celebrity spaces, were folks who would jump up before a camera or a microphone and automatically just say this, right? Oh, okay, this, I believe, you know, 
I support this or I support that. No, get the information for yourself as, as we're talking to uh, um, the sister's question earlier, right? And that was beautiful when, when you were trying to um, define for yourself what historicity means and break it down, right? That's what each and every one, yes, it might take a little time, right? But you were able to Google it really quickly, right? You know, I'm wishing, you know, somebody on Capitol Hill got your Google skills, all right? right? Okay, come on now. Um, no, but this, this is what we're talking about, right? Just one or two extra seconds of thought, right, could prevent a whole bunch of craziness jumping off, right? But yeah, but neutrality is unacceptable, right? Now, we can question and wonder, okay, what can I do? Right, All right. So, but neutrality is not the same as a, um, a sense of, of helplessness or hopelessness of apathy. Right, right. Now, if you're saying, okay, that's none of our business, you know, I, I beg to differ. Right, because many of our, our greatest uh, thinkers and, and leaders, right, here we are on, on the cusp of the King holiday. Right, right. If you start stand by when injustice is happening, when when dehumanization and demonization is taking place, right? You are no better than the person who's doing that, right? You are complicit with that, right? We live in, unfortunately, we live in a culture and a nation where half the nation stood idly by while slavery was taking place and was complicit and comfortable with it until it became uncomfortable with it, right? It was inconvenient and then they did something about it. When you know that you could have done something from day one, Segregation, same thing, right? Many of the great social uh, um, travesties and, and scandals and controversies that we're dealing with right now could have been called out on day one, right? Folks made choices to say that this is okay or this is good enough, right? So neutrality is unacceptable, especially if we are bound together by this web of mutuality that Dr. King once so, so nobly and proudly talked about. What, what happens to you will eventually happened to me. All right. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is David Street, and I am a member of Alpha Street. <laughs> I've got to mention that last time. Right. But just some no, more. No, it was radiating from you, man. Yeah. It, was, it was like, it was, it was shining off you, man. But just some more food for thought. I am a military veteran as, as well. Yes, Retired sir. Thank from you the for Air your Force. service. All right. And currently, I work for the, the National Archives and Records Administration, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, in my capacity there, I worked on a um, development of, a pol of the policy um, that was a recommendation from the 9-11 Commission. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you talked about the 9-11 um, situation happening here and how Israel said that the October 7th uh, situation was related to was there 9-11, it's a parallel, yes, mm -hmm. the parallel. So mm -hmm. one of the major recommendations from the 9-11 commission, it was that there were certain parts of the government that had information on how uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks happened, mm -hmm. but they didn't share the information. Mm -hmm. So I worked on the policy for two years um, that said that as, as relates to sensitive but unclassified information, this is how we should share that type of information. And so the National Archives was given uh, that job to develop that, mm -hmm. to share with every part of the, the federal government. Mm -hmm. And so I could see how uh, the, the, the terrorist attacks in, in, in Israel is related to that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that Netanyahu was a captain in the, in the Israeli military. Mm -hmm. And so that informs how he is conducting the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want us to keep that in mind, uh, this whole thing. He, he wants to, to, to elim totally eliminate Hamas, which in my mind said is possible. That means you have to wipe out people. Mm -hmm. Totally, mm -hmm. that's called genocide, mm -hmm. if we really think mm -hmm. about it in that aspect from a military perspective. Mm -hmm. So just, just some food for thought. And I thank you, sir. I thank you. All right. And especially as a historian, I appreciate the, the work that y'all do at NARA. Um, but also, uh, let's, let's think about two things very quickly. And I, I see other folks are, are lining up. Thank you. Um, first, in terms of information 
and knowledge. Um, I once again tap into uh, um, Frederick Douglass, who in his writings, I think this is in his uh, um, book, uh, my, my Bondage, My Freedom. He talks about education makes one unfit for slavery, right? The, the access to knowledge and better information, right? The ability to, to work and move on your curiosity and figure out, okay, this doesn't make sense. How do I make it make sense, right? To be fully free and functioning people in the world, right? That ability to have all the information that I need in order to make the right decisions and to, to live my best life, right? That is necessary, right? That's necessary in your own household, and that's necessary when, when you're conducting uh, the affairs of, of government and, and uh, you know, trying to deal with the world at large, right? Same logic, right? But the idea that if we're not having a, a, a flow of information from one side to the next, right, because of politics, literally, right? You're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, so we can't talk. Or you know, you're trying to withhold because it doesn't look good on you that this event, this traumatic and tragic event happened on your watch, and now you're trying to clean up the mess on aisle six, right? Because, and I will say this, now this takes me to the second part about Netanyahu, is that on the one hand, as a political philosophy, as, as something bone deep for this individual, right? He does want to see the takeover of Gaza. He does not want the Palestinians anywhere within these borders. He's not ever, made himself uh, um, available to a two-state solution, right? But the idea that he wants all power, but having had all power, October 7th, 2023 still happened, which lets you know he doesn't have all power, right? So this goes back into that, that kind of panic frenzy that Thurman is talking about, right? Those folk, power doesn't panic. Right. True panic. I don't believe my God has ever sweated a day in God's existence, right? Right. True power, right? Right. You know, Netanyahu isn't flexing, he's cramping, right? He's like, I gotta do something, right? So he does the worst thing possible, right? Because he thinks that this show of force and, and strength means that I'm a big, powerful man. No, it shows that you're scared, right? But I should not have to suffer for your insecurity, right? And that might translate to other people's existence in this world as well, as far as uh, other uh, relationships that might need to end as well, you know, not talking anybody's kitchen table talk, but okay. So anyway, all right. If it works, work for you. Anyway, so when we think about that, right, he's held these philosophies, as, as uh, the brother has said, since the 70s, right? If you're still holding on to something from the 70s, Right, right. You know, you got your, you know, you got your gear from '77. You might have to let it go, or, or, you know, or freshen it up a little bit, freshen the fit up a little bit. Okay, please. I'm sorry. Please, who's no, next? No, no. We. I'm sorry, Deacon T. Oh, I'm sorry. You had your hand up. Oh no, I had a question from the chat. Okay, well, there are two other people behind me. My name is. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. What did I cut? I'll go here? wherever y'all lead me. Oh, I was right here. Okay, okay. My name is, um, I don't want to give my name now, um, Eva Stokeswood, and I too am a proud member of uh, Alpha Street Baptist Church, and I'm also a Dallas Cowboy fan. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Them boys, okay. Okay, okay, Ooh. okay. Um, since, you, since you have at least millions of people online listening to this um, awesome event, my question is, what can you say or should you say or should anybody say to the young people who are protesting, in which I'm all for protesting, mm -hmm. been doing it all my life, mm -hmm. but who say they are not going to vote in the election or they are not going to vote for, mm. for, uh, for President Biden. Mm. I cannot go through, God knows I cannot mm -hmm. go through another Trump Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I just Nor can't. should you have to. No, Nor should no any of and we should not have to. But I want to make sure that the young people who are exercising their right to protest, which I uphold, but I don't want them to put, give away one thing and then end up with a lifetime of nothing else. Yeah. Mm. So I just want you to speak to them, whatever your opinion is on it, so that they can understand that this is a life or death moment for us. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And even though I know who God is and mm -hmm. I know God has control, I still cannot deal with another year, another right. four years of the maniac. Thank you. All right, first of all, hopefully, uh, hopefully this will show. All right, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. you you're sister from another mister. We're of one accord. Um, I thought in writing this, and you know, I was, I was trying to permit for more time, but I, I left this on the cutting room floor, but we're gonna bring it right back, uh, like a old, old 100. We're here in the King weekend. Um, Dr. King, when he stood in Riverside Church back in April 4th, 1967, and delivered his, his speech against the Vietnam War, I'm gonna lift this up. I think the words are as true then as they are now, and they speak to what you're talking about, uh, dear sister. Right, oh Eva, you're just wonderful. Right, I come to this magnificent house of worship, that could be me right now. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. A time comes when silence is betrayal and a time has come in, us in relation to Vietnam. He later would go on to talk about the idea that if you are going to be a true citizen, not only of the United, these United States, or these yet to be United States, as Maya Angelou would say, but also of the world, right? Yes, right, there may be the uncomfortable uh, feeling of, all right, I'm choosing between these two again, Biden and Trump, right? Um, uh, the psychologist uh, um, Sigmund Freud called this the narcissism of small differences, right? Okay, <laughs> these two old white guys, right, on either side of the political aisle. But the issue remains, okay, split the difference here, right? One is not a moronic demon right. or a demonic moron, depending on, you know, you, you, you toss the coin and, and figure out which side of that you, you, you choose, right? If you know someone has no good for you, no interest in your well-being, might only be running for the office simply so that they could run away from jail or run to the bank with all the donations that they're getting from, from the, the followers that they're robbing blind, right? Versus someone who, yes, many faults, many, many personal uh, things that he's got to wrestle with to overcome, but someone who actually cares about governing, someone who actually cares about those he is governing, right? Someone who is actually and honestly, regardless of what side of the political aisle you, you, you sit on, right, is actually trying to think, how do we make this thing better? How do we keep this thing working, right? How do we even begin to advance what's best for the least of these, right? So yeah, the, the younger generation who believe, oh, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? They don't understand, right? It can always get worse, right? You gotta expand your pessimistic imagination, right? Because I thought that 2016, let's, let's say this right now, I thought 2016 was, was the worst year ever. Then 2020 came along and said, hold this. Watch me work now, all right? We don't need 2024 to be a, a, another replication of that, right? So if you've got somebody, especially a young person in your life that you love and want to lead to, to a better world, right? Tell them, get out there and do something, right? It was not comfortable, yes, vote. Yeah, King, it was not comfortable for King to make that stand. And we ultimately understand the price he paid a year later. But we do not have neutrality as our, as our blanket. Right, as our, our comfort. All right, please. We have, we have 10 minutes to get through three questions. I'm gonna ask you to send, make the question short, please. Okay. You had a diagram up there with uh, four different years, 1946, right, 47, right, the map. and then- The map of the uh, Nakba, yeah. Yes, and in 46, they had so many, um, so the Palestinians occupied so much of the land. I know that they always talk about the Middle East being in constant conflict. Mm -hmm. Did those people get pushed into smaller pieces of the land or were those people murdered? Mm. Okay, um, quickly to honor the time. Um, both, both and. I mean, uh, there's at least a three-way process here, right? Some, some were killed unjustly, unfairly, um, unsuspectingly in conflicts, regional conflicts. Some moved out, right, got out of here, right? You know, either elsewhere in, because as you saw, like there was some scatterings about places they were permitted to travel within Israel, right? If they were still going to stay close to the place they call home. Or some, and this is another interesting uh, 
issue about the politics of the region, right? You would have these neighboring Arab countries. I'm talking about Syria, Lebanon. I'm talking about Egypt, talking about further stretches out, Iraq and Iran, right? They would make all this noise about the mistreatment of the Palestinians, but wouldn't have an open door immigration policy to the Palestinians, right? So they would talk all this talk about loving, loving or, or needing to support the Palestinians, but even in violation of, of Islamic teachings, right? What, what good Muslims should do for one another, right? Weren't sending aid into Israel unless it had strings attached, and I'll, I'll leave that there, or weren't allowing them into their own uh, uh, countries and communities because they were afraid that, you know, we got hungry mouths to feed here, so why are we gonna let, you know, refugees, basically what we're talking about with the dispossessed and disinherited, right? right? Why are we gonna let them into our country? Uh, yeah, I love you, but I love that you stay over there. Right? If you've ever had that cousin or, or you know, somebody like, you know, I love you, but y'all stay over there. Okay, right. I'm gonna send you a cake and a Christmas card later, but you know. Okay, so, um, so that's what's happened. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Natasha, and I have a quick question. Um, so my simple question is this. Um, you mentioned that neutrality is not an option, mm -hmm. right? And so bringing it back to the church, what is the call to action or what is the charge mm -hmm. for the church as it relates to what is happening in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of nations that are calling for a ceasefire, mm -hmm. the United Nations as well. Mm -hmm. And so what is the charge for the universal church mm -hmm. um, or even for the black church mm -hmm. um, as it relates to that? And then there's a part B that I wanted to add to her question, yes. which is there are a lot of educated millennials mm -hmm. that millennials, Gen Z, I mean all generations that are just like, none of my votes mattered. Mm if we look at it, the world, mm -hmm. I mean, America as it is today, mm -hmm. especially, I, dare I say, um, minority groups. Mm -hmm. And so what, do you, what is the message there for them to encourage them to, again, vote mm -hmm. and not give up? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, both are wonderful questions. Uh, let, me, let me go this way. Um, the first and foremost thing, um, Democracy dies, not just, uh, um, democracy dies with every ounce of disappointment that we heap onto it, right? If we think that our votes don't count, if we think that I'm doing all this and nothing's happening, nothing's changing, right? right? We cannot treat uh, democracy passively, right? And here, like I'm talking about right here in Alexandria and other parts of, of, of the DMV, I'm talking about in the United States, I'm talking about in the world at large, right? Unfortunately, we've gotten so, I'm talking about all Americans, but especially, um, you know, recognize this, okay, um, thankfully, uh, gratefully, uh, my wife and family, uh, we were able to travel to the Bahamas uh, just recently in celebration of that 15-year-old's birthday. Um, you know, don't play a hate, celebrate, and then uh, participate. Uh, <laughs> in the Bahamas, they were celebrating their 50th year of, of independence and their anniversary. Now, think about that, okay? Right, you know, because, you know, and our daughter, you know, she's been well-traveled and, and seen more parts of the world at her age than I probably have seen right now. Um, <laughs> that's a slight joke. Um, but the idea that um, you know, for us, right, you know, we're coming into, you know, almost 250 years of, of independence for, quote unquote, independence, uh, depending on where you grew up, you know, independence uh, in uh, the United States. But the idea that as a full functioning democracy that included and incorporated everybody, America is running about a 55 year track record, right, right? It wasn't until the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act before we, so, you know, if we turn our eye this way or that way and look at other countries around the world, however, we still the new kid on the block too, in terms of being what we were supposed to be, what we were also always supposed to be, all right? But that can't die on our watch. That should not fade away simply because, uh, I don't know how this voting thing works, or, uh, man, it'll never change, or, right? That, because that's what the wrong people 
a profit from or benefit from is us getting tired, us getting weary, us, us falling down instead of standing up. And this might sound like a whole bunch of, of happy talk, but it's also what helped our ancestors survive so many atrocities, so much problem, okay? All right, and I also wanna respect the first part of the question, right? The idea that as of right now, churches don't, we have been handcuffed sometimes by ourselves in terms of what our, our possibility, our power is, right? So A, Yes, you know, um, approaching our government and, and denouncing immoral activities that are happening in our name, right? That, right, if certain uh, um, church groups or, or denominations can help prop up uh, um, uh, political uh, candidates, even though those political candidates don't represent or reflect any of the teachings of Jesus, right, right. right in terms of, of you know, not lying, staying faithfully married, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, causing uh, harm to other people. You know, just, uh, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments. I, I think God wrote a list called the Ten Commandments, right? If they can support that kind of individual, right, but can't condemn unlawful, unjust killing of innocents, right, in the name of, of all right, and here we go, right? To condemn, and to condemn state violence, to be anti-state violence is not to be anti-Semitic. Right. All right, let me say that with my whole chest. All right, All right. I want to condemn wrong for, because it is wrong in and of itself, right? So I condemn Hamas and their terrorist actions, right? There's no, no justice in that. But I, uh, their kidnapping of hundreds of innocent people I, I find that atrocious, but I also find atrocious a government that says that the only way that it can stay in power is by bludgeoning and brutalizing other human beings. I also condemn that. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, all right? And the church, if no other space or place in the society should be able to speak to that, it should be uh, communities of faith and good conscience. Yeah. I I know time is, oh, 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 sorry. Not oh, disrespecting okay. the online crowd. Sorry, yeah, this is the online question. This is from Kyle Stevenson. Um, and he asked, and this kind of fits in with your comments just now, because he asked, can you contextualize Dr. King's quote regarding Israel's right to exist? And Kyle draws the distinction between the right of a people mm -hmm. to exist versus the right of a nation state. Okay, I will do the best I can. Um, when in his age, the, the crisis and the conflict that was uh, the focal point was the Vietnam War, that was a regional conflict as well in, in Southeast, Southeast Asia between North and South Vietnam, right? First of all, it was a conflict that we ought not have had any role to play in. We historically, nor uh, um, in immediate terms, had a dog in that fight, except that um, many presidents, both Democrat and, and Democratic and Republican, saw it as an extension of the Cold War against our, our war against uh, Russian uh, international aggression. But in that mode, right, we fueled what was ultimately going to be a 10-year conflict, right, um, in Vietnam and the surrounding area, talking about Cambodia, Laos, and, and Thailand, and, and other regions of that sort because we did not want to accept what was happening on the ground, that the, the Vietnamese people under Ho Chi Minh and, and others were, were coming together and they would have determined themselves to be a communist uh, uh, country. And that was unacceptable to many of the leaders of our country. But in doing so, as King argued at the time, Right, because, uh, by the way, by this time, he had already won the Nobel Peace Prize. It wasn't the Nobel Negro Prize. It was the Nobel Peace Prize. Right? He, he was somewhat of an expert and authority on peace. Right? You know, he was also a minister of the gospel. You know, Jesus. All right. So you know, on, on this credible ground, he thought that he could speak to the world and say, look, I am condemning. I'm renouncing. And you're by this point, it would have been year three or four of the 10-year involvement that the United States had in uh, Vietnam. He was trying to stop the madness. And he was saying that as much as I love America, as much as I want to save and redeem the soul of America, I would not be living up to my calling, my vocation 
as a, as a Christian minister if I did not speak to my, na my nation being the greatest purveyor of militarism, of, of uh, capitalism, of, I mean, you know, of violence worldwide, right? You know, he's speaking directly to that, right? And, and as flat-footed a fashion as possible. And in this context, and, you know, hopefully um, this will make sense, is we look back now, all these years later, right? You know, thankfully we've got monuments and holidays and, you know, um, you know, department stores have sales in the name of Dr. King. So that's, that's the most important symbol of, of his acceptance in mainstream society, of course. Um, but the idea that um, people don't circle back and say, you know, King was right, if, if you notice, right? That his, his commentary and criticism on the war was, he was on the right side of history, right? I, you know, as, as we say um, in these, in these uh, church circles, right, you know, when, when my day, when my time comes, I want to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. If I have to stand against the entire world to do what God says do, I'm going to pick God's side on this one, right? And I'm doing it right now, right? Um, this is my truth. So to this point, the idea that whether it was Vietnam in uh, King's time or now we're looking at the, the crisis and conflict in Gaza now, right? To do anything and everything possible to redeem the possibility of, of humanity, of human life and existence, and not just, um, you know, scratch level. I'm not just talking about, you know, just bare bones existence, right? We have to guarantee I think first and foremost, a two-state solution in this crisis, in this conflict, right? And one in which both states, right? Because uh, we are also a people who've uh, had to um, survive and overcome the notion of separate but equal. Have you heard of it, right? Yeah, two things can exist side by side and yet not be of the same quality or not of uh, living up to the same standard, right? So we want two states that both are thriving and flourishing. Right? And one is not the stepchild of the other. We're going to have to stop there. I am sorry that we are out of time, but that always happens when we have this level of engagement. Before we thank Dr. Floyd Thomas one more time, I just want to go over where, where we've been since 930. We started with scripture. Then we defined terms. We looked at a geopolitical map. We invoked Howard Thurman. Cat Williams showed up somewhere in there. <laughs> we drew from Al Arabito, James Baldwin, Foucault, Edward Said, Howard Thurman again, and Jesus. This is interdisciplinary thinking. And we're so grateful to you, Dr. Thomas, for sharing with us so richly over the, this time. So can you please join me in thanking him one more time? Thank you. Thank you. This is why we come to Alfred Street. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.